Uh, we have a, a blessing tonight. Brother Kurt Smith is going to preach. Uh, good to have the Smiths with us. It was a blessing to see them here this morning. And uh, just out of the blue, about 1.30 or 2, I texted him and said, Hey, would you like to preach tonight? And uh, he agreed. So uh, Brother Kurt's going to come and preach tonight. So I hope you'll get your Bibles out and uh, get ready to hear from the Word of God. The last time Brother Kurt preached, I think about two and a half years ago, uh, if I remember right, he preached on four reasons Jesus was thankful. So I don't know if you're preaching that tonight. But anyway, it was, that was a good message. And uh, I, I appreciate that. And uh, looking forward to hear what the Lord's put on his heart tonight. You come with me. All right, take your Bibles and turn to the Romans, if you will. We're going to speak on three reasons to be grateful. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, not four, not four, three. No. Uh, we, we're going to be speaking today today about the purpose of the living sacrifice. The purpose of the living sacrifice. And so, uh, if you will, turn to Romans chapter 12. And uh, that's where we'll be. I know that's a, uh, probably a passage of scripture that many of you have memorized. I hope you've got this memorized. It's uh, one of those uh, classics. And uh, we're going to talk about this a little bit this evening. And it is an honor to be here. Love it here. And uh, it is a little warmer here than it is up north, I will tell you that. And, uh, but we enjoy it. And uh, uh, just so thankful for it. And uh, so th thankful for your church. I was telling your pastor today. You all are doing it right. You all are doing it right. And I appreciate your pastor. I hope you appreciate your pastor. You've got a, a, a man who is allowing, allowing God to use him in a great way. And uh, boy, I tell you what, I hope you'll tell him from time to time that you appreciate him and that you're thankful for him. Um, and uh, he's done a great job here, hasn't he? And uh, so anyway, I, I'm just ex excited. I love hearing the reports with Tim. Uh, from my in-laws, you know, uh, they'll tell me about things that are happening and exciting things, people getting saved, and that's what it's all about. And uh, so, anyway, what a privilege. An honor to be here, sir. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, it, it means so much, so, so much, uh, means the world to me. Romans chapter 12, let's look at verse number 1 and verse number 2, as so many people have done down over the years. But let's look at these verses, and I want to talk to you again about the purpose of the living sacrifice. Romans chapter 12, verse number 1, the Bible says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity once again to open your word. What a privilege it is, Lord, to watch you work. And we pray, Father, that, Lord, you will do just that again tonight. That, Lord, you would use your word in an unusual way. I pray that everyone in this room, myself included, would, Lord, be sensitive to your leading. That, Lord, we would be searching tonight for something and Lord, I believe with all my heart that if we come that way, that we ask you right now in this moment, that Lord, we would ask you to speak to us and give us something that Lord, it will help us uh, to be what we ought to be for you. I know you'll do that. So God, please, I pray that our hearts be right, that uh, Lord, that you would help me. I pray that Lord, you stop me from saying something, Lord, that you wouldn't want me to say. May uh, you bring to my mind those, those things you would like for me to say. I just want to be obedient to you now. So please help us, and we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Well, I don't think I have to tell this church and uh, because of your testimony, but I will just tell you this. Uh, I've just about had it with all of the experts out there today in this in society. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I've tried to keep up to date. And, you know, as the preachers, we try to do this a little bit. Um, and so, you, you know, you, you listen to the news or you read the news and you, you listen to things that are going on. And I want to tell you, just plain and simple, that I, I'm, I'm convinced that we have heard all that we really need to hear. Um, and, and what we need to do is to move away from the experts, all right, and the professionals, and we get back to this old black book. Because when we get back to this old black book, we're going to find the answers that we need. And so I'm going to invite you to join me uh, this evening to go back now to this old black book 
and look at these precious words. How many are here of the evening would agree with me that this book is a living a a book that's alive? Amen. And even though we're looking at some words and some sentences here that we have looked at for so many years, many of us, we can gain much from it. And so we have here before us Romans chapter 12, and of course we have before us this living sacrifice, but we're going to do our best this evening to pick, up, pick it apart and look at it very closely and read carefully this familiar portion of Scripture. And I want to again answer a few questions in regards to this, the, the living sacrifice. I want you to notice, if you're taking notes, first of all, uh, this again, uh, and we'll, we'll talk, uh, let's, let's look, look over, if you will, at chapter 11, and I want to read to you some verses that we typically do not read when we are looking at Romans chapter 12. Typically, we focus right on that, but we don't go back. And, and listen, it is vital that you get the context from which Romans chapter 12 and verse number 1 is given to us. So many other times, again, we'll read a portion of Scripture and we don't have the sense that God wants us to have concerning this. So would you please, would you please join me and let's look at this and let's read, once again, chapter 11. And we'll just read for time's sake, we'll read verse number 25. We'll start there, all right? So Romans chapter 11 and look at verse number 25, all right? The Bible says, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery. Let's just stop right there. We have, of course, before us the Apostle Paul, all right, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, penning these words for us. Is that right? And so here we have the Apostle Paul, and Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant. I don't want you to be ignorant of this mystery. Lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, There shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Your pastor talked about repentance. And the next, this coming Sunday, I believe, uh, your Sunday school teacher will be talking about repentance. You need to be here and get in on that. But uh, that's for, I, I don't want to get into that right now. Uh, being distracted by that. But, but he talks about this repentance, that the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. That's important for us to understand. That the gifts that God gives to the church, the callings that God does, the calling, the work that God is doing, he, he, he gives it to us, he gives us the gifts, he gives the callings, and they are without repentance. Now that's important. Why is that so important? Well, notice what it says next. For as ye in times past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief. Even so have these also now not believed, that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all. Now tonight you may say, Pastor, what, uh, Kurt, what, what in the world? Why would you read that? It is vital that I read that. And we'll come back to that in just a moment. But I want you to notice, first of all, if you're taking notes, the plea for this living sacrifice. The plea for the living sacrifice. Again, Romans chapter 12, verse 1, you're right there. Look at it again. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brother, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Notice what he says here. He says, I what? Beseech. I beseech. I plead with you. I, I'm pleading with you. Listen, this is, first of all, a plea. It is a plea. I want to tell you, you know this, there is such a need today as there was in Paul's day. 
It's, it's just as much of a need today as it was then. And I want to tell you, God is pleading with you. God is pleading with me. God is pleading with us tonight. And uh, why is he doing this? Because it's so important. Because there's purpose. Not only is it a plea, it has purpose. There's a good reason. He says, I beseech you, therefore. I beseech you, therefore. He's Again, that the word therefore speaks of reason. It speaks of purpose. And God is pleading with you and I today in 2020. He's pleading with us because there's this great reason to do so. And I want you to notice something else about this plea. It is a present plea. It's not just for the future, but it's for today. It's for right now as you're sitting there, as I'm standing here, and by those who may be watching, listen, this is for you, and it is for this present time. And God was, of course, was, was speaking through the Apostle Paul in his day, but he's preserved his word for you and I. And I want to tell you something. God is working today just as much as he was in Paul's day. Now, you and I don't understand what's going on. How have you been a little bit, a little bit discombobulated over the last two or three months? Yeah. You know, what is God doing? What is going on? Well, listen, God is at work. You can take heart tonight and be excited tonight. Listen, you and I live in exciting times. Because God is doing a shaking. He's certainly shaking America. And from what I've seen on the news all over the world, there is a shaking going on. And we would attribute all some of these, these, uh, to these, ne these negative things that are happening, we attribute it all to the devil. But listen, nothing gets past God. God doesn't allow, uh, excuse me, God, we, we think that God doesn't allow bad things to happen, but he does. Yes. How about Job? Yeah. And so God is allowing these things today in our present time for a reason. And just as in Paul's day, there was a plea for a living sacrifice, there's a plea today. Yeah. You and I need to take this serious. And even though we've heard this message before, would to God tonight we would understand that every one of us, uh, this is again vital that we, whether we recognize it or not, that God is issuing this plea. Number two, if you're taking notes, I'd like for you to notice the purpose. And this is really the thrust of the message, but, but what is this purpose of this living sacrifice? I think you might be surprised tonight to know really what it is. Because for so long we have not taken this portion of scripture and, and, and again, interpreted it properly. We have not went back and looked at the verses before. And, and, the, and so I want you to, again, keep in mind of chapter 11 and look at verse number 32 again. Because it says, For God hath concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all. The purpose of the living sacrifice. If you go back and you look now again at Romans chapter 12, verse number 2, it says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good, acceptable, perfect will of God. Here is the purpose. Right here in verse number 2. The purpose of the living sacrifice, that again, that we've heard so many times, is, is that ye... And by the way, that's plural. By the way, aren't you thankful for the King James, yes, the Old yes, King yes, James yes, Bible? Yes, I appreciate the stance that this church has on the Old King James Bible. Yes, but notice it says ye. That's important because that's plural. And, and again, that's that's those to all. That ye, that ye, what? Well, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Here's the purpose. Listen, and we discover this purpose by, dis by, again, looking at some definitions. Number one, notice the word prove. That ye, that's you, that's me, that's us, that ye may prove. Say, preacher, what's that mean, prove? Well, it means to test. It means to verify, if you will. 
Uh, hold your place here. Turn very quickly, if you will, now back to 1 Samuel. We've got to hurry. But I think this very illustrates well uh, what we're trying to, to say here. And uh, notice what the, this, uh, the Bible tells us in 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17. Maybe you've heard this story before. It's a story about a young man who is very upset with the fact that there's a big man who's defying God and the armies of God. And he's very upset. Maybe you've heard of him. His name is David. David and Goliath. Have you heard this story? Sure you have. And so here we find we have David and Goliath. And, uh, and of course, Goliath's there. And he's defying the armies of God. And, and David is upset about it, you know, because he's defying God. He loves the Lord so very much. And so, of course, he decides he's going to go ahead and fight Goliath. And uh, so here's what happens, though. As, as, as he's talking to King Saul, of course, he reiterates in verse number 31, 30, uh, 30, 36. He's, he basically says, look, Saul, I can take this guy. I can go out against Goliath and take this guy. Because, look, God has worked before. And God has used me in the past. And I know that God can use me now. And listen, this means again to find God. And uh, I can do this. I know the Lord's, and notice verse 37. It says, David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he, I like this, don't you? Look at this. He might deliver me. Is that what that says? No. It says, he will deliver me out of the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said unto David, what? Go. And the Lord be with thee. And Saul armed David with his armor, and he put an helmet of brass upon his head. Also he armed him with a coat of mail. Now, do you get the picture? You remember this? Uh, here now, Saul says, look, uh, here, take this armor. Now, by the way, I will tell you this. I, I know that since I was a little boy, I was taught that, that Saul gave him his actual armor that, that belonged to him. But it doesn't really say that clearly. I wouldn't fight anybody over that. But it might have been that he was just given to him what, what Saul wore in battle. All right? I don't know. But the point of the matter is, though, is here's the point. God tells us what the point is. Because it says here that, that as he's doing this, it says that David girded his sword, verse 39, upon his armor, and he is saying to go. He tried to go. He, he put this, on, uh, this armor on, and he tried to go. For he had not... There's our word proof. He had not what? proved it. He had not tested it. He had not tried it out. He had not verified that it would work for him. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off. So, with that in mind, go back now to Romans 12. And notice here what this word proof means. And again, it is this idea of verifying, testing, uh, it, it, is, it, is, it means to approve or to reveal, to reveal, to prove its authenticity. Listen, we try or we prove, all right, this, this will of God by putting on something. We'll, we'll mention that in just a moment. So the definition of proof, look, notice something else, the definition of the will of God. What is the will of God? How many of you would like to know what God's will for your life is? You know, and by the way, I, I can tell you what it is. You want to know what it is? It, you want to know? Here it is. Ready? It's to be obedient to the Holy Spirit, the Word of God. That's it. That's it. If it were a location, if it were a vocation, you could go to that location or have that vocation, and you wouldn't have to do anything other than just be in that locale and just have that title. But it's more than that. God doesn't want you and I just to be in a certain place. He wants to, to do certain things. He wants us to please him. And so here's this will of God. But he says the definition, uh, again, uh, is, is the desire. It's what God wants. 
The will of God means the want of God or the desire of God. All right, look at the next thing. Notice the details or the definition of this desire. It is given to us here in this next verse. What is the definition or, or, or you might say what are the details of this desire? Well, here it is. Look at verse number two again. It is to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So the first thing is that it's good. God's will, God's desire is a good desire. How do you agree with me on that? Amen. That's all he has is a good desire. God's desire is good. What he wants is a good thing. It is right and it is just. And listen, God makes no mistakes. Listen, you may not like what God wants, but listen, it's for his glory and it's for your good, by the way. He has your best interest in mind. Listen, I don't want to tell, I tell, I tell you what, there's been some things that have happened to me personally here in the last three or four months. I don't know what's going on. I'm just really not sure what's going on. But do you know what I know? Is that God is doing it for his glory. And he's using it with my best interest in mind as well. What an amazing thing. And I don't know what you're going through, but I want to tell you something. I know people, and, and I've lived long enough to know that you've got something going on in your life, don't you? There's some issue. There's something that you're facing. There's some concern that you have or some questions. And I want to tell you something. God loves you. Never doubt it. God has your best interest in mind. And, and listen, this desire, this will of his is good. It's acceptable. You say, preacher, what's that talking about? It's acceptable. Well, listen, it, it is the, that, that the Father is okay with it. That the Father, God the Father, is okay with it. It is an acceptable will of God. And then notice what else? It is perfect. See, so, preacher, what's that mean? It has the idea of completion, of being full, fulfilled. It fully completes or fully satisfies. And so what is then this purpose? Well, we, we've got it. Review. What is the purpose of the living sacrifice? Are you ready? I'm going to give it to you. It is to reveal to a lost and dying and searching, by the way, I believe in our day, a searching world that God is merciful. And not only is he merciful to his own chosen people, the Jews, but he is merciful to the Gentiles. Yeah. Do we have any Jews in here tonight? I don't know if we have any Jews or those watching. I don't know if you're a Jew or not. But I want to tell you something. This is great news for me because I, I is a Gentile. I'm a Gentile. Notice, go back now and say, preacher, why are you saying that? Well, go back now and look again at chapter 11 and notice what he's talking about. Go back to verse number 13. Romans 11 and verse number 13. It says, For I speak to you, who, class? Gentiles. Inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles. He was the apostle of the Gentiles. You say, preacher, what does that mean? Well, hang on. Uh, hold your place there. Turn over to Acts chapter 9. Let me show you what that means. What, what, say, preacher, what, where did that come from? Why did Paul say that? Well, Acts chapter 9. Look at verse number 13. It says this, Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. Do you remember this? This is the story about, this is about the conversion of Saul, who later became the Apostle Paul. You remember that? How, how he got saved? And so here's Ananias, and he's talking, and Ananias is talking about this Saul and, and, and how he had killed Christians. Look at verse number 14. He goes on to say, And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. Ananias is a little nervous about this guy by the name of Saul. Why? Because he killed Christians, right? But God had come to him and said, Look, I want you to go to this man and I want you to help this man. And so he goes on to say, But the Lord said unto him, Now this is not, this is not even the Apostle Paul. This is Jesus now speaking. This is the creator of the universe who's speaking about Paul. And it says this, verse number 15. It says, he says to Ananias, 
Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. You see, God was going to use Paul in a great way to reach the Gentiles with the glorious gospel. And now go back to Romans chapter 11 and notice again where we were reading and notice what it says again. He says, he says in verse number 31, even so have these also now not believed that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. In other words, the, the Jews rejected Jesus Christ and because of the rejection of the, that the Jews, again, it, it, Demonstrated because they rejected Jesus Christ, it opened the door for the Gentiles. And so now the gospel is going to go forth. And it says, For the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. For as ye in times past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief, even so have these also now not believed, that through your, what's the next word? Mercy. They also may obtain what? Mercy. mercy. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. I don't know about you, but I don't know what makes me want to shout. Because I think of what, what Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 3, and verses 1 through 9. Let me just give you verse number 9. It says that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. By the way, Jesus is coming again. That was the promise that he was referring to. And he says, The Lord is not slack concerning his, uh, his promise, as some men count slackness, but is what? Long suffering. How many glad tonight that God is long suffering? Who I know I am. <laughs> he's he's, he's long suffering. He's not willing that any should perish. But that all should come to repentance. That they would turn from their sin of trusting in them, their own selves, to get themselves to heaven. And turn to Christ, who is the only way to salvation, as we heard this morning. So I will notice now, again, this, this is a, uh, the purpose, again, is to reveal to a lost and searching world that God is merciful and that he wills or that he desires, he longs that all are saved. Listen, we, we again, the preacher said this already, but, but listen, we, we believe in a whosoever will gospel. Right, right. Whosoever will may come. Right. Yes, the apostle was pleading with his fellow brothers and sisters in Christ by the what? He was pleading again. Look at it now. Romans 12, 12 verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the what? By the mercies. I, I, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may what? That you may prove. That you may test. That you may try. That you may, again, Prove or show the, the authenticity of God's desire to save the world. Amen. Listen, you, you know I don't understand the significance of being a living sacrifice, I don't think. It is vital that we all, as sons of God, children of God, to be a living sacrifice. Amen. Because what it does is it shows that God has been merciful to us. But when we live a life that is outside of that, when we live to ourselves and we want to do what we want to do and we don't give in and don't yield to the Holy Spirit of God, we don't yield to the Word of God, what happens is a lost and dying world does not see a merciful God. Amen. That's what we need. Oh, man, I praise God for grace because that is Christ. That is, that is the riches, God's riches at Christ's expense. And mercy is not receiving what we deserve. 
Not receiving what Christ received. But Jesus came to this old sin sick world for me and for you. What you and I deserve, Jesus took. Jesus, again, by the way, is our living sacrifice. How many glad today he's living? <laughs> he's alive. And he maketh intercession for us. And he's that, he's that sacrifice. By the way, once for all, I'm not saying that he's giving his life over and over. over. He, he, he gave his life once for all. But what I'm saying is that he is alive. And listen, would to God we would understand that this mercy is for all. This means the Muslims. This means those that those neighbors that you don't really care for. Those people that you work with that just get under your skin. Do you know that they need to see you as a living sacrifice? So that they can understand that God is not this this mean, angry God that hates everyone. No. They need to see him as a merciful God. They need to see him as a merciful Lord. Notice number three, if you will. The presentation. The presentation of this living sacrifice. Notice, if you will, go back to now Romans chapter 12. Look at it again. Because it tells us. That, that he says, I beseech you, therefore, brother, by the mercies of God, that you present. That you present, that you give, that you yield, that you give over. That you pre the presentation of the living sacrifice. That you present your bodies. Notice, it is a bodily sacrifice. You know, you've heard this before, I'm sure, but your walk talks and your talk talks. But your walk talks a whole lot louder than your talk talks. You see, God wants us to be a living sacrifice, not in mere word. That's easy. But what God wants you to do, my friend, what God wants me to do, is that he wants you and I to be indeed, very deep, bodily, a sacrifice. You say, preacher, are you saying that God wants me to take my body and burn it? <laughs> Offered up as a sacrament? No, that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about, again, is a, is a sacrifice that is real. Again, that is real. It's not just mouth, but it's, it's actually what we're doing. It is a bodily sacrifice. By the way, Jesus died and was buried and bodily arose, right? We believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. And listen, we are to live, uh, we are to, again, it's a bodily exercise, uh, a sacrifice. Notice something else here. That it is a living sacrifice. It's not just dead, it's living. You say, preacher, what's that mean? It just has the idea of being continual. It's, it's not just a once in a lifetime thing, but it is a sacrifice on a daily basis. Years ago, I, I uh, was, was told about a book that I, that I purchased one of the greatest books that, that ever has really helped me. And uh, it, it, in this book, it had this question, when did you die? When did you die? You know what? Unless a corn of wheat fall into the ground, there's not going to be much fruit. We have to die in order for there to be much great fruit. There, and I'm not talking about just physically. I'm talking about spiritually. We, or we've got to die to ourselves. We live in a day and age where we want to live unto ourselves. We've got our goals. We've got our plans. We've got our agenda. We've got what we want. And so often we forget those around us. We forget the Lord and what he wants us to do. Can I ask you something? When did you die? When did you place your life on the altar, so to speak? Has there ever been a time where you said, Lord, you can have my life. Lock, stock, and barrel, as we used to say in West Virginia. Have you ever done that? Oh, how important it is to get a hold of that, that we are to present our, uh, our, ourselves as a living sacrifice, bodily and, and in a living manner. And then notice here something else. He goes on, he goes, I beseech you therefore, brother, by the mercy of God, but your, your body is a living sacrifice? Holy. I say, preacher, what, what, is, what, what does it mean to be Holy. Well, it has this idea of being separate. You know, we serve a thrice holy God. 
a thrice holy God. And we don't hear much about holiness anymore because we're afraid, because people might misunderstand what we're saying, right? There's different religions, different, different uh, people who talk about that in a different manner. But holiness means, has this idea of being separated and it has the idea of purity, but, but it, is, it is a separated. Our God, you remember Isaiah said, saw him and he was what, high and lifted up. He's high and lifted up. He's separate from. Oh, would to God we'd have some young men and young women and old men and old women who would separate themselves from this old world unto God. I said separate themselves. Uh, you need to make the decision. Not your mom, not your dad, not your grandparents, but you. Not your preacher. I praise God that there, there are pe preachers and people who are, who are dedicated to Christ, who separated themselves unto God. Praise God for that. But I want to tell you something. God wants you to separate yourself unto Him. To be holy. You know what? Uh, just uh, in a, a very short time here, in October, my daughter, who's sitting back here in the back, is with us, is going to be married. Well, at least she thinks she's going to get married. I'm telling you, I'm struggling with it. This is the last one. Those of you who've had children, you've had other ch several children, you, and you, as your baby, your baby girl, you know, is the last one. It's going to be tough. But you know what? She went and, you know, I don't know why they do this, but they, they, she went and spent all this money on a gown, a dress, a wedding dress, and uh, saved me all kinds of money. Got this great deal, I praise the Lord for it. And then she came to me and she said, Dad, um, or, or maybe, I think, I think actually it was my, my wife who actually did this, went to bat for her and said, well, well there is this veil, and, and so it really goes well with the dress. I'm like, great, great get it. And then she said, it cost. <clears throat> and I'm like, what? But, you know, she's doing her best. She's getting the best that she can, and she should. And what a wonderful thing it's going to be, and what a glorious time it's going to be as she gets married. But you know what she's doing? She's separating herself unto this guy. She's separating herself unto this young man for life, right? And she has to make sure that every day, even after they're married, that she continues to make sure that she's separate from everyone else and only unto him. And you know what? You as a Christian... Listen, it's not enough that last week you separated. It's not, it's not enough that as a young man or as a young lady in a camp somewhere, you dedicated your life to the Lord. Wonderful. That's wonderful. But listen, you and I on a daily basis must, again, be that presenter of bodies, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable, as we've already talked about, acceptable, again, of our own volition. By, by the way, God wants a sacrifice that's of our own volition. Right. It's, you and I ought not serve God because someone else wants us to serve God. Right. You need to serve God and you need to give your life to Christ because He wants you to. Yeah. And, and uh, of your own volition. But Paul said, the love of Christ constrained me. It wasn't someone else. It wasn't something else. It wasn't peer pressure. It wasn't, well, this is what my family does. It, it was the love of Christ that so stirred him, that constrained him. And he of his own volition became that living sacrifice, didn't he? Notice here very quickly also reasonable service. And not, God doesn't always do this, but here he even gives logical thinking. He gives reasoning to this. That, look, this is just your reasonable service. And again, it is a transformed sacrifice. No longer controlled and confer, uh, conformed by a lost world standards, but transformed by the mind of Christ. Take your Bibles. I'm almost finished. Take your Bibles to Philippians chapter 2, if you will, and, and notice what it says here in Philippians chapter 2. And I hope that if you didn't get anything else tonight, you get this. Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 5 or 11. And I want to show you 
how you can have this transformed mind, this renewed mind, this remodeled mind, if you will. Philippians chapter 2, notice what it says in verse number 5. Philippians 2, 5 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Do you believe tonight that this is you, that this ought to be you? That your mind ought to be the mind of Christ, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a what? Servant. Servant. And was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. That ought to be your mind. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And it's, listen, it's not just merely to be a servant. If I were to ask tonight, how many believe that we should be a servant? We should serve the Lord, that we should be a servant of God. Everybody in here would probably raise your hand and say, yes, I believe that, preacher. And you know what? You'd be right. But I'm going to tell you something. The purpose of a servant is not to serve. I'll say that again, because you probably think I made a mistake. But the purpose of a servant is not to serve. The purpose of a servant is to obey. There's a great difference. I can serve and serve and serve and serve and serve and serve Jesus and serve Jesus and do this and do that and not do what God wants me to do. You know what we do? We play games with God. We play games with God. We, we, we make these little deals with God. We think we do. God's not buying it, but we think he buys it. And we say, well, you know what? I'll go to church, but I'm not going to do that. Uh, Lord, I know you're speaking to my heart very clearly through your word right now and through your spirit. Oh, I'm not going to think about that. I'm not going to think about that. I, I'm not going to do that, but I'll do this. We try to, we try to make deals with God. Listen, you may be so busy in this church or at your home or in your business and you may say, I'm serving God. And you may be serving God. But what God wants is your obedience. Do you remember Saul? King Saul that we referred to earlier? Do you remember what happened to him when he did not do what God told him to do and take out that entire army? And all the animals. You remember all that? And you remember what the prophet said through, God told him to say this to Saul. He said, to obey is better than sacrifice. sacrifice. You see, the living sacrifice, the purpose of the living sacrifice is to obey the Lord. It is to obey the Lord and to share forth the mercy of God and how God has been merciful to you. How many in this room, I wonder tonight, uh, has been, God's been merciful to you. How would, uh, God's been merciful to all of us. Amen. If I got what I deserved, I would be in hell tonight burning. But God has been merciful to the sinner. Yes. And all praise God he has been. And I need to share with the world how good, good God has been to me. Some Christians can't be a testimony because they're always griping and whining and complaining. And, you know, they're never smiling. They're never laughing. They, they, they you know, take themselves so seriously. And I want to tell you something. You have a lot to rejoice about. And you got to share that great news. And not only that, but you should share with them that God is merciful, not just to his own chosen people, the Jews, but he is a God who longs that all be saved. That's the purpose. So tonight, can I ask you, are you the living sacrifice that God has called you to be? I didn't ask you if, you, if you're sacrificing. I'm not asking you if you serve. I'm asking you, are you the living sacrifice that God has called you to be? You know whether or not you are. Are there things in your life that you're holding on to that God doesn't Listen, God wants to do the incredible, the miraculous. And if there's ever a time that light will do a great work, it is in this day. 
We live in dark days, don't we? Spiritually speaking. Dark times. Hey, that's exciting. As long as we will just die to ourselves and yield ourselves a living sacrifice and share with the world that God is a merciful God. Are you seeing or others seeing around you just how merciful God's been? They see that God is good. Are you leading folks to Christ? Do you know this living sacrifice? Because if you don't even know him, you certainly can't be that living sacrifice for him. It's time tonight to reevaluate ourselves. It's time tonight, and God wants you, every one of you, just as he wants me, to take some time and examine ourselves and see where we are. And the great thing is this, is that if we've not been what we ought to be, you know, all it takes is just taking the first step. You know, th over the years, I have made some mistakes. Anybody in here made mistakes beside me? Yeah. Whew, good. Matter of fact, I've not just made mistakes, I've sinned. I've sinned against God. Sometimes we just say, well, those were mistakes. No. Let's just call it what it is. Exceeding sinful, right? And I've been exceeding sinful. Even as a preacher, there have been times when I've not done right. I've, I've been maybe deceitful or things like that. I've tried to make sure that I'm living right. But there have been times like that. But listen, as we examine our lives, we've got to ask God to help us. We've got to ask God to help us to make sure that we're living what we are, the way we ought to live. And uh, tonight, I hope that all of us will do just that. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Lord, I pray that you will just take, Lord, your word once again, as we've already asked you already today, and just have your way. Thank you again for the opportunity. And Father, now I've got to practice this. And I pray, Lord, you show me tonight, Lord, that next step that you want me to take. Lord, help me not to, Lord, just focus on all of the failures, but Lord, help me to focus on you and how you can turn things around. Help me to be what I ought to be. I pray for these tonight that are in this room. Help us just to take that very next step. Or sometimes we, we can't go back and fix everything, but certainly God, we can take one step. Help us to take that step you want us to take. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name we ask it.